good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Hey, welcome to, this is week six, if you can believe it, week six of our series, Back to the Basics. Hey, if you were here last week, you know that we, we talked about, you know, if there's ever this moment in your life, or maybe it was a certain situation, or maybe, maybe for you it was a full chapter of your life that you would love to just have a do-over. Is there anyone here who would love to have a do-over with some part of your life? Yeah, good. There's at least a few people who are telling the truth. That's good. You know, and maybe for you, maybe it was something, you know, that you did in high school, or maybe it was something you did in college. Maybe it was something more recent, like with a, a certain relationship, and, and you've started to really feel regret or shame. Maybe it's something you have held on to for quite some time. You know, maybe it was something you did, maybe something you said, maybe it was something you looked at, and maybe the sin was just so great that the thought of what you did, you still kind of wrestle with today. It still haunts you today. So last week we posed the question, what can wash away my sins? What can wash away all the weight of my guilt and shame of my past failures, mistakes, and sins? And so last week we learned that the answer to that question was God's forgiveness. You see, God gave Jesus Christ all power and authority to heal the lame, give sight to the blind, even to raise people from the dead. But God also gave Jesus Christ the authority to forgive each and every one of your sins and my sins. You see, through, through the death of Jesus Christ, God has actually canceled your debt. See, when you place your faith in Christ, your sin is forgiven. Your debt is canceled and Jesus takes your sin and he actually carries it away. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But why? Why would he do that? Why would God do something like that for you and me? Well, it's called grace. It's grace. To discover grace is to discover God's utter devotion to you and his resolve to give you a cleansing, a healing, and a love that lifts the wounded back to their feet. I'm going to ask you this morning, have you ever been given such a gift of grace? Has there ever been a time in your life where you received something that you really didn't deserve? You know, I remember my eighth grade year of middle school. Uh, it was almost like it was yesterday. For, for the most part, uh, my eighth grade year was absolutely amazing. My father had just transferred to a new school district where he was a history teacher and a football coach. And I went to uh, Brandenburg Middle School. And uh, it had actually been several years since I had been at the same school that my, where my dad taught. And so I thought it was awesome. I thought it was really cool to actually have my dad right down the hallway. Eighth grade was also the year that I met my wife, Kara, and I quickly fell in love with the blonde hair, blue-eyed girl in my class. All in all, it was a good year. It was a very good year. However, there was one situation that I will never forget during my eighth grade year. Now, before I tell you this story, a couple weeks ago I told you a story when I was in fifth grade, and uh, I didn't show you a picture of myself, so I thought this week I would show you a picture of my eighth grade self. Now, here's the cool story before you see it. I called my dad this week, and I said, I need you to send me a picture from when I was in eighth grade. And of all the pictures that he had, look at the shirt that I was wearing. Keep in mind, I lived in Texas. I have no idea. I have no idea. Now, if I don't say this next sentence, I may not be welcomed back into my family's home. So I have to say this. My father is a devout Dallas Cowboy fan. You thought I was going to say Christian, right? He is a devout Christian. He is also a devout cowboy fan. He wanted me to make sure every single one of you knew the only reason he put his son in a Michigan shirt was because it was on sale at Walmart for $2.99. It's the only reason. <laughs> and that. All right, so back to the story. So one morning I was sitting in my history class and for whatever reason I was bored out of my mind. And my teacher, still remember her name, Miss Bauer, was having a conversation about how the government was organized and how a bill was passed. 
So instead of, you know, passing a bill, I passed my time by starting to cut up with my buddy Michael in the back of the classroom. And so we started playing this game where we would whisper something funny, you know, into each other's ear. And the winner of the game was actually the one who could get the other one to laugh out loud and get in trouble. I was a very mature eighth grader, by the way. Very mature. So after several attempts at trying to get Michael to laugh, I figured, you know what? I'm just going to go for the big one. And I leaned over to him and I said something incredibly rude about my teacher, Miss Bauer. Now, little did I know, because I wasn't paying attention, that while I was trying to make Michael laugh, my teacher, Miss Bauer, had seen our shenanigans, and she had actually walked around the room, and she was standing directly behind me when I leaned over and said some unfortunate words about her to my friend. As soon as I said it, I kind of turned around, and she was staring at me, and I almost lost my lunch. And so without saying a word, she grabbed me by my arm and she marched me down to my my dad's locker room office. My dad just so happened, it just so happened to be his off period. And so in my mind, I was like, oh great, for the next 30 minutes, he's going to rip me a new one. And so Miss Bauer told my dad what I had done and she demanded that he discipline me and then she marched out of the office. So there I am standing before my father, knowing that I was about to get a major whooping because I was guilty. I was fully guilty, and I deserved the punishment for the horrible thing that I had said. And as I looked at my father, trembling, knowing the outcome of this was not going to be very good for my backside, he looked at me and he said, Brian, grab a basketball. Now, honestly, my first thought was, oh my gosh, he is going to spank me with a basketball. This is not going to be good. (laughs) But to my surprise, (laughs) I picked up the basketball. He picked up one himself, and he told me to follow him to the gym. And for the next 30 minutes, I got to shoot some hoops with my dad. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say we had fun. There was no conversation. Nothing was being said between us. The whole time, I was just waiting for something to happen, you know, some sort of extreme punishment to take place. And then suddenly the bell rang, and all the students started to dismiss to their next class. And my dad walked over to me. He grabbed the basketball out of my hands, and he said, Brian, what you said to Miss Bauer will never happen again. Do you understand me? (laughs) That's all I could do. That's all I could do. No words came out of my mouth, and I could not believe that that was the extent of my punishment. You see, on that day, my father, he taught me a very, very valuable lesson. I never forgot it. It was a lesson about grace. You know, the stories of God's grace, which which drench every chapter of his word, from, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, are some of the most important stories in all of Scripture. And these stories of of grace, they actually include a very broad range of men, women, some rich, some poor, some powerful, some powerless. And as we read God's word, we oftentimes, we, we parachute ourselves into the lives of these characters at a time when, when his or her future seemed to sort of hang in the balance. And for all of them, there was this moment of discovery where the grace of God tipped the scale in their favor. So how do we get grace. How do we get it? Well, the truth is we don't. We don't get grace, but it sure can get us. Grace hugged the neck of the prodigal son. It scared the hate out of Paul, and grace can do the exact same in us. I want to ask you this. Do you ever feel like your life, that your life is so messy, or maybe you've made so many mistakes that you have completely drained God's grace account, and the overdraft free fee is so substantial that the price that you would have to pay just wouldn't be worth God's investment? Do you drag regrets around like a bro- broken bumper of a Chevy? And it has to be a Chevy. If it was a Ford, it wouldn't be broken. Hi. Dave Clifford in here? That was really for Dave Clifford. Is he not in here? He missed it both services. Unbelievable. Do you get angry more than you experience joy? Do you wonder whether God can do something with the mess of your life? If so, 
Friends, it's grace that you need. You need grace. So today I want to explore. It's really a, it's an interesting look at grace. It'd be easy for me to just share with you what grace means and just sort of provide you a biblical definition today. But I want to go even further than that. I want to look at grace and I want us to answer this question. How does God's grace happen in your life? How does it actually happen? So, hey, I hope you brought your Bible with you. If so, turn to the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Very good. That's the fourth book, all right, of the New Testament, chapter 8. And I want to read you an absolutely incredible story, verses 2 through 11. And just listen to how God's grace just washes over this text. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down, and he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down, and he wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again, and he said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again, and he wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. I want you to imagine for a moment, all right? It's a quiet, peaceful scene. Early one morning as the, as the sun begins to peek over the horizon, birds are whistling and a soft, cool breeze fills the temple courts where Jesus is teaching his students. And suddenly the calm of the morning turns into a riptide of accusations as the Pharisees thrust this woman into the middle of the morning Bible study. Shame on you. Pathetic. Disgusting. They shouted. And the stunned student stood in silence as the Pharisees humiliated her in front of Jesus. This woman, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, her accusers said. The law of Moses says to stone her. So Jesus... What do you say we should do? Did you see in the scripture what his response was? Nothing. He didn't even respond. In response to their question, Jesus said nothing. He actually bent down in front of the woman and started writing something in the ground. Scripture doesn't tell us what it is. Wouldn't that be so cool to know what Jesus was writing? A later verse says, I love this, that Jesus stooped. I love that word. He stooped down and he wrote in the dust. I mean, now look. Look at this scene. I don't want you to let this moment pass. Wouldn't we actually expect Jesus to do the opposite here? Why didn't he stand up and push his way forward or even climb a stair so that he was actually above everyone? Instead, he bent down. He leaned over. He actually descended lower than anyone else there. He was below the priests, below the people, and even below the woman. And as the accusers looked down at the woman, they actually had to look even further down to see the face of Jesus. Have you noticed throughout Scripture that Jesus is prone to lowering himself for us? He bent down to wash feet, to embrace children, to pull Peter out of the sea, and to even pray in the garden. He bent down before the Roman whipping post and lowered himself to carry the cross. And here once again, we have Jesus, and he's stooping down in front of the woman, and he's just writing something in the dust. So the crowd started to grow impatient with his silence, and so they continued to demand an answer. And so Jesus lifted himself up until his shoulders were straight and his head was held high, and he stood that morning not to preach, for his words were very few. He simply stood on behalf of the woman, placing himself between her and the angry mob, and he said, okay, go ahead. 
stone her to death. But let those who have never sinned go ahead and throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and he started writing something in the dust. Do you know what happened next? Thuds. Name callers became silent, and the only sound in the temple courts were the thuds of their rocks hitting the ground. And one by one, the rocks fell to the earth, and each accuser slipped away until the only ones left were Jesus and the woman. And then Jesus stood on her behalf once more. He looked her in the eyes, and he asked her the question of a lifetime. He said, where are your accusers? Does anyone condemn you? She replied, no, no master. Then Jesus said, well, neither do I. Go, go now and sin no more. That's grace. That's grace. Grace happens when Jesus acts on your behalf. Did you know that Jesus has actually acted on your behalf just as he did for the woman? Jesus has bent down for you, and he's bent down for me. He has bent down low enough to sleep in a manger, low enough to sleep in a fishing boat, low enough to be spat upon, slapped, nailed, and speared, and even low enough to be buried. But here's the cool thing. Jesus also stands for you. Up from the grave he stood right in the face of Satan and he stood tall and he stood high. He stood for the woman that day and he silenced her accusers and Jesus Christ will do the exact same thing for you. I love this verse in Romans. I don't know if you know it. Romans chapter 8 verse 34. Just write that down somewhere. You want to make sure you know this verse. Here's what it says. Romans 8 34. It says, Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. If you're familiar with the message version of the Bible, I love how they phrase it. Here's what they say. Christ is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for you. Isn't that great? I want you to let that sink in for a moment. In the presence of God, in defiance of Satan, Jesus Christ rises to your defense and he acts on your behalf. That's grace. Let me ask you this morning, or better yet, it, better yet, let God ask you this question. Where are your accusers? You see, some of you today were awakened by voices of accusation. Some of you, maybe every morning, you experience what the woman experienced that day. You feel emotionally like you have been dragged out in public and paraded down the street. That this man or this woman was caught in the very act of, and then just fill in the blank, whatever it is for you. And it's like you can hear someone accusing you every single day. You live in a spirit. You live in a world and in, in, in an environment of constant condemnation and accusation that that you were caught in the act of, and just fill in the blank, whatever it is for you, you were caught in the act of, and it's like someone knows the list of every single mistake that you have ever made, and just when you take one giant step forward, then someone pushes you back into the center of the crowded voices, and they begin to megaphone your sin, that this person was caught in the act of immorality, stupidity, dishonesty, irresponsibility, and these voices go on and on in your head, and you can't ever get them to leave, and finally you ask the question, do the voices ever stop? stop? And the answer is no, they don't. Why? Because Satan never shuts his mouth. The apostle Paul called Satan the great accuser. Revelations 12, 9 through 10, here's what it says about Satan. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before God day and night, has been hurled down. You see, friends, day after day, week after week, hour after hour, Relentless, tireless, the accuser makes a career out of accusing you. 
And he has one, one goal, one goal, to steal, kill, and destroy. He steals your peace, he kills your dreams, and he destroys your future. And he has even deputized a horde of demons to help him in his attack. And you see, these attacks, they seem to come from any and every direction in your life. Friends make you feel bad about your past. Your boss tells you that you're never going to amount to much. Or maybe you grew up in a family that that ate a plate full of guilt for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and all you heard growing up was that you would never be as good as your brother, or you're too dumb, you're never going to have a good job, or you're never going to find a man that's going to love you. And these voices come into your your head kind of like 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 a distress signal that's been on a loop for 30 years, and it plays over and over and over in our minds, almost at like a subconscious level. And suddenly these voices of accusation start to define you. I have a friend who says he thinks his mother and father used to own a travel agency because they specialized in guilt trips his whole life. (laughs) Isn't that sad? It's kind of funny, but it's sad. Maybe you know this feeling. I know you know this feeling. We all do. But I want you to rest confidently in the fact that Jesus Christ is sticking up for you, and he's acting on your behalf. Even though this grace, even though this kind of grace from him, that he would stick up for you and act on your behalf, even though this grace is undeserved, he will silence your accusers, and he will give you a clean conscience, a clean record, a clean heart, free from accusation, free from condemnation, not just for our past mistakes, but get this, also for your future mistakes. So look, here's the thing. You can spread your arms open wide this morning and you can say goodbye to stupid, unproductive, slow learner, fast talker, quitter, cheapskate and say hello to spiritually alive, heavenly position, connected to God, a billboard of mercy and an honored child of God. Amen. Amen. Grace happens when Jesus acts on your behalf. And look, everything that he did for the woman caught in adultery, he will also do for you. But hold on a second, because this is where the story gets really awesome. Did you know that God will actually do something for you and me that he did not do that day for the woman? For the woman, Jesus gave his help to her. For you and me, Jesus will give us his heart. As far back as the book of Ezekiel, this is what I love about the whole part of God's word, Old Testament and New Testament. As far back as the book of Ezekiel, we see that the desire of God is to actually give to us a new heart. Here's what he says in Ezekiel. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you, here we go, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Friends, the promise of scripture is that when you give your heart to Jesus, he returns the favor. Grace happens when Jesus gives you his heart. Give your heart to Jesus, he will give you his. Now look, I want you to picture this for a second. This is cool. Picture God's grace. Track with me. Picture God's grace as a heart surgeon, all right? God's grace is a heart surgeon. Grace cracks open your chest, removes your heart, poisoned as it is with pride and pain, and he replaces it, your old heart, with the heart of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.12 says this, the mystery in a nutshell is this, Christ is in you. That's awesome. Christ is in you. In a lot of ways, you could sort of call that a spiritual heart transplant. Tara and Todd Storch understand this miracle as much as anyone can. God blessed Todd and Tara Storch with three absolutely beautiful children. But in April of 2010, they took their family on a ski trip where their 13-year-old daughter, Taylor, died in a skiing accident. 
And all of a sudden, the parents, Todd and Tara, they found themselves having to make the unspeakable choice of a casket, plan a funeral, and answer this question. Would you like to donate her organs to needy patients? Few people needed a new heart more than Patricia Winters, a resident of Phoenix, who had been suffering from heart failure some five years earlier. Her heart was so weak that all she could do each and every day was sleep. Taylor's heart gave Patricia a fresh start. Tara, the mother, only had one request. The mother wanted to hear the heartbeat of her daughter one more time. So she and her husband Todd flew from Dallas to Arizona, and there they went to the home of Patricia Winters, and Patricia gladly received them into her home. The two mothers embraced for a very long time, and then Todd, the husband, the father, embraced the two mothers. And after some moments, Patricia herself, a registered nurse, went to the drawer and pulled out a stethoscope. And she invited Tara to listen to her daughter's heartbeat one more time. And so Tara placed the stethoscope against Patricia's chest. And she listened once again to the heartbeat of her daughter. It's so strong, she said. Yes, it's very strong. I want my husband Todd to listen. And so her husband Todd then listened to his daughter's heartbeat. I want to ask you a question. As Todd and Tara listened to that heart, whose heart did they hear? Did they not hear the still beating heart of their daughter, Taylor? As God listens to your heart, whose heart does he hear? Does he not hear the still beating heart of his son, Jesus Christ? Now look, you might say, well, Brian, you, you don't know my heart. I've made too many mistakes. That's not what I'm asking. You might say, well, I don't feel like I have Jesus inside of me. I'm not asking you how you feel. I'm simply asking you to look at what the Bible promises. That if you give your heart to God, he returns the favor and he gives you his. You see, God's desire, get this, God's desire isn't just to get you into heaven. God's desire is to actually get heaven inside of you. You can't forgive your parents? Well, guess what? Jesus can, and he lives inside of you. You can't control your anger? Guess what? Jesus can, and he lives inside of you. You can't forgive that jerk of a husband? Well, guess what? Jesus can, and he lives inside of you. You can't stand that grumpy old teacher at school, Miss Bauer? Well, Jesus can, and he lives inside of you. Look, you belong to Jesus Christ. And once you give him your heart, he immediately starts packing his suitcases full of grace and he permanently takes residence inside of your heart. And slowly, here's the cool thing, slowly he starts commanding your hands and your feet and he starts transforming your mind and your tongue. And soon your bad decisions and your horrible habits are repurposed. And little by little, a brand new you begins to appear. That's grace. That's grace. A God who loves you so much that he will act on your behalf, he will stick up for you, and he will silence your accusers. That's grace. A God that loves you so much, he will remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that is now God-willed, not self-willed. Friends, God's grace it has a drenching about it. It has a wildness about it. A white water, rip tide, turn you upside downness about it. Friends, look, you, you can't go get grace. Grace comes after you. It's pursuing you. It rewires you from insecure to secure, from regret riddled to better off because of it, from afraid to die to ready to fly. One of the most basic principles of Christianity is that we are saved by grace. And God will sweep into heaven anyone who will give their heart to him. Let's pray. Oh, 
Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace. I don't necessarily, Lord, want to speak on behalf of everyone, but I, I know that in my own life, I have often had a very difficult time accepting your grace. I've always wanted to sort of sit over in the corner and feel sorry for myself or beat myself up with words or emotions. I've heard time and time again in my own life, the accuser, Satan, the enemy, saying, Brian, you're not good enough. Brian, you can't do that. You're not smart enough. Oh, but God, just like the waves in the ocean, I am so grateful that every time I have heard those lies from the enemy, that wave after wave of your grace crashes against my chest where I'm consumed by your grace, consumed by your love, and consumed with the thoughts that I am not who Satan says I am. I am who you say that I am. And I'm a billboard of mercy. <laughs> I'm a child of God. And we thank you for those promises, Lord. So Father, I pray for each person in this room today that they would continue to experience your grace. And I also pray for those who have never received the gift yet. And let's be honest, I know I was there. Sometimes it's pride, sometimes it's arrogance, sometimes it's stubbornness, sometimes it's simply not understanding what grace is. But there are times where we push you away and we refuse to receive the grace that you want to lavish on us. And so today, Father, I ask, for those here who struggle with accepting your grace, Father, I pray the chains would just uh, drop away. Your spirit would consume them and remind them that your grace is sufficient. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.